Hey everybody, Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com, back with some Pittsburgh Steelers tape breakdown and analysis. Want to talk about something that won't be fun, but it may be cathartic to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers and their very poor run defense in Sunday's loss to the Baltimore Ravens, allowing 215 yards on the ground. The question is, why? How did that happen? While there are other issues in this game, including three turnovers, all things that should be pointed out. I want to focus today on Pittsburgh's run defense, and I I would categorize probably three reasons in three main buckets, we'll say, as why the run defense was as poor as it was. A, missed assignments. B, being out-schemed. And then C, and maybe most importantly, just getting your butt kicked. Baltimore being the more physical team winning the point of attack. So this will be a longer video, as I'm sure you guys can tell. So buckle up, and let's talk about it. I'll start here by talking about missed assignments, times where Pittsburgh was simply not in the right gap, and really there's nobody that is is absolved from this performance. We're going to look at basically every single member of this front seven, and they had a play or two at least where things went wrong. First play here is going to be the Ravens' biggest run of the day, J.K. Dobbins' 44-yard run, setting up his touchdown the very next play to get Baltimore a 10-0 lead. And as you guys see, that massive hole that J.K. Dobbins had here through this A-gap um, is the reason why he was able to accelerate, get downhill, and nearly score. So what happened on this play? I think first thing to point out is, in just more of an uh, overall thought and theme of the game, Pittsburgh trying to stem their front quite a bit, meaning this late line shift, which has actually been really successful for Pittsburgh. They've gotten a lot of false starts and. Um, you know, that late motion is, I think, really kind of wrecked some teams. So I understand why they did it. But I think some of this late motion when you're trying to get set, maybe not as egregiously here, but it's maybe caused Pittsburgh to be in the middle of a shift, basically, as the ball was being snapped. But watch Cam Hayward here, who is A, not a nose tackle, is admitted he does not like playing nose tackle. There is no nose tackle on the field in the sense of Tyson Alualu or Montrevious Adams. It's Ogan Joby, it's Warmly, and there's Hayward in the middle. Um... On this play, he has the uh, play side A gap. And so if you look at the responsibilities to run fits, I'm not going to go through every single one here, but uh, Haywood's responsibility on this play is this play side A gap to the strength between the center and the right guard. He gets doubled here initially by the center, and the right guard gets turned around. And I understand maybe he was trying to split the, split the double team and try to turn his shoulders, reduce surface area, but he gets you know turned out here, sealed, and then turns himself away from the play as well and never has sight on the ball, and it's definitely out of his gap. So is he the only guy to blame on this play? No, no one's getting off a of blocks, Bush, Jack, although those guys appear to be in the right gap uh, on this play. They're fitting the run as it's drawn up, just not maybe executing well, but Kim Hayward's the guy that loses his contain here, loses his run fit in that A gap, and that's exactly where J.K. Dobbins runs through for a 44-yard gain. Though it wasn't the biggest issue of the day, there were some contain issues on this play. We're going to see here on the right side that this uh, run bounces, and it should have been able to bounce. This one should have been contained, and DeMarvin Lee Allen probably more so on Terrell Edmonds allowing this run to the outside. Kudos here to Chris Wormley. He does a great job to beat the right tackles block and get on the fullback as well. He spills this run, and spilling the run means forcing the back to bounce, forcing him to run to the perimeter to where his force help should be, whether that's Leal or Terrell Edmonds trying to turn this one inside, and they let the hat, the runner, get to the outside and Gus Edwards to uh, to gain the edge, and that should not happen here on this play. So to look at it from the aerial view here, um, you see Edmonds here at the bottom. There's Leal, warmly spills it to the outside. This one should be contained, should be basically no gain on this play. I don't know if Leal had the, the contain here or the inside gap. It would make sense he would have. The inside gap, I don't know if he's outside and Edmonds has alley. It's a little hard to tell, so it's difficult to me to, to, to assign maybe blame on one specific person on this play. But clearly, this one should not get outside the way that it does, and it results in a in a good run when it should have been essentially a, a run for a loss or, or no yards. The last play we'll look at from a missed assignment standpoint is going to be the lone quarterback scramble of the day. The rest of these will be uh, designed runs basically entirely by by running backs here. But Tyler Huntley, a mobile quarterback for Baltimore, and he made some plays with his legs as well. And this one's on TJ Watt. And I understand 
there's a, a line to walk between how you rush trying to get after the quarterback, trying to make a play versus keeping him within the pocket. And I don't know for sure if TJ Watt had what you call a two-way go, meaning the freedom to rush outside or inside. My feeling is, though, he probably shouldn't have rushed inside here trying to swim the right tackle. In that case, Tyler Huntley, the escape lane, uh, to pick up this first down. And a nice finish there by Minka, but shouldn't have happened in the first place. So when Watt swims to the inside, I understand his calculation is, if I can beat the right tackle, I can get to the quarterback, make a play. But that does give the lane there for Huntley to rush outside. Watt not able to double back and cut this one off, and uh, it's Huntley going for the first down on this play. So there's a risk-reward to it, but I think on this play, uh, Watt obviously just an outcome alone, you know, screwed up here, gave the contain lane, and Huntley used his legs. Now I want to discuss some schematic issues. In Baltimore, all of their schemes worked, whether you're talking inside zone or gap scheme, but their gap scheme was effective, especially late in the game, but it had success really throughout. So this is second half stuff here, um, backed up near their own end zone, and they're going to run gap, but they're going to pull a couple of these linemen. They're going to gain a gap and gain advantage to the uh, the front side of this run here. I want to take you guys back, though, pre-snap. I thought one thing that uh, Baltimore did well was using some of these twin sets and displacing the Steelers edge rushers and Pittsburgh was obviously in their base defense and heavy personnel throughout and so there were no slot corners to uh to to cover number two because they're, they're big people and Pittsburgh got to, has to stay big to uh, play the run obviously that's fair but sometimes one consequence to that is you see the outside linebackers be forced to walk out and TJ Watt walked out here really not involved in the run fit on this play and now this tight end has a much easier easier block. Instead of being in line to the core, he's trying to block TJ Watt uh, 1v1. He's now out in space, and Watt really a non-factor on this play. So that's one element of things that I think came up a couple times in this game. Um, B, you're seeing Pittsburgh overload to this side. So they're playing with um, three essentially outside linebackers on the field in Watt in Highsmith, and there's the Marvin Leal, who's a defensive lineman, but in this role, we'll call him an outside linebacker. And so their they're kind of the strength here defensively is to this side. And so Baltimore intuitively is, let's not run to that side, let's run to the field. And that's what they do here, and they add pullers in that to gain gaps here. So they're pulling the guard, and they're pulling left tackle, and that creates extra gaps there for Pittsburgh to try to account for on the fly, and it becomes a good run by J.K. Dobbins to give Baltimore a lot of breathing room here. So from an assignment standpoint, I don't know if I see a ton of obvious issues. There there may be some that I'm not seeing, not knowing the team as if I'm, you know, part of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, but I just think the idea, the principle is, you know, Baltimore is gaining numbers and they're basically running away from some of the Steelers' strengths. And and oftentimes Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh and some of their overfronts would play a guy in the A gap. And so it would be a little less than picking a side. I think one other thing just to note that Baltimore did well in this game was Pre-snap, they didn't really always show a strength. They were pretty balanced. They didn't put multiple tight ends to one side. Here, they have a tight end here in Josh Oliver, and their fullback there, who had a great game uh, in, in Patrick Ricard. So they could really go either side and have the same amount of numbers. It's different if, say, they're putting the tight end over here, then Pittsburgh stacks this side, and you're trying to run this way, but then you, you're losing some of the numbers because you're not balanced. You have a, a clear strength to one side, and that's something that came up a couple times in this game, probably more than a couple times, and Baltimore just gaining numbers here. Pittsburgh can't match it, and they're trying to play catch up the whole way. Other scheme play I wanted to note, and I'm stopping this one uh, before everyone's even set because that's sort of the point. Now, at this point, Anthony Brown is in the game, the third string Ravens quarterback, making his first uh, ever appearance, and you're seeing two things A, Pittsburgh switched to this over front, and so they're shifting kind of late here and again. Those late shifts, is that best for a defensive lineman as they're trying to get set and put their hand on the ground and read things as they're moving and the ball's being snapped? It's probably a consequence to that. Um, but here again, Baltimore running power with the guard, with the fullback, gaining numbers here, gaining gaps to the front side of this run and, and running away from Pittsburgh's overfront. So here you have Kim Hayward on the tight end. we got the, the, the tackle shifted three tech. Uh, Highsmith here in this A gap or in this, uh, yeah, this is the A gap here, I think. Um, and Baltimore is running away from that. And so they're gaining numbers. They're running away from Pittsburgh's strength on this play. And it creates a big hole um, for the running back, J.K. Dobbins. And DeMonte Casey has to make that open field alley tackle. Now, again, there are 
physical issues on this play. Loudermilk's getting beat up. We can talk about Devin Bush and um, Miles Jack and all those kinds of things. All valid. I don't want to discount that, but just schematically, you're seeing Baltimore gain numbers and smartly running away from Pittsburgh's over front. And that's something that the, the uh, Detroit Lions did. I, I did a video on that, a long form one like this one last year when the Lions put up 200 plus on Pittsburgh and very smartly was they consistently ran away from that over front. They were not going to run to the tight end side where you had Mark Andrews on Cam Hayward, not a winning matchup. And again, you're seeing a balanced formation, tight end here, tight end there. They can run either side, they pull, they gain numbers. And so uh, they really gave themselves a lot of freedom to respond to however Pittsburgh lined up and run opposite of that. And so there were physical issues on this play, but schematically Baltimore was often one step ahead. Okay, last section here, and this is just the old butt-kicking section where Baltimore was the stronger team, the more physical team. They consistently won at the point of attack with their linemen and also their other pieces. Ricard was one of their MVPs of this game. Josh Oliver blocked well, one of their backup tight ends. And so I'll go a bit quicker because it's really a little more self-explanatory in the sense of you're just seeing Pittsburgh get dominated at the line of scrimmage here. Everybody blown off the ball, nobody getting off a block, cornerback Levi Wallace forced to fill and make the tackle here, and you're just seeing all this space that uh, that Baltimore is able to create up front, and Dobbins not even touched within five yards, pushes the pile forward, and it's a good gain um, for them. I think it was even defensive holding here called on Montrevious Adams, so despite the holding call, still allowing a good run overall, still getting blown off the football. Just want to show you from the aerial view. Again, no one getting off a block. All this space there for for, uh, for Baltimore to run, and that really sums up this game. Although not one of Baltimore's best runs of the game, just watching some of those 1v1 matchups, the battle within the battle, and watching Josh Oliver, who's not known as this phenomenal blocking tight end, to my knowledge, just folding Robert Spillane on this play. And so not a big run overall, but just watching the tight ends consistently beat up on Pittsburgh's inside linebacker. Spillane's a tough guy, the run guy, generally doesn't lose that poorly. But when, they, when he's getting folded, that kind of sums up the entire game. And again, nobody really looking great here overall. Um, Baltimore finishing their blocks. You see Ricard really mixing it up with, with Miles Jack here on this play. Again, it's just the tone, the tenor. Uh, Baltimore was more physical, more intense. They finished their blocks. They really took it to Pittsburgh consistently in this game. I think this example above all others shows how much of a push that the Ravens got in this game. So I like to show that. It's it's harder to see from the uh, end zone view, but the aerial view can often show that a bit better. And again, they're pulling people on this play, so it goes back to, to gaining gaps and gaining numbers we talked about earlier, making essentially Terrell Edmonds useless on this play, just simply running away from him, not, not part of the run fit at all. Another potential schematic thing to talk about, but just watch the push here, especially at the end. I mean, Dobbins not touched within the first five yards, and he's got, you know, burst acceleration following the block here, 79, and just every pile going forward, and that's a good run here. I don't know how many yards exactly it gained. Too many, obviously, in Pittsburgh, just not getting off of blocks, you know, everybody getting walked back here. Dobbins finding a lane and, um, you know, picking up good yards, and so we'll look at it from the end zone view one time. But just not getting off a block. It's as simple as that. Is that if you don't get off blocks, you're not going to stop the run. Same thing here. Very next play and watch Montrevious Adams in the middle just get run out. And Linderbaum, their, their first round pick, the uh, rookie from Iowa, just having his way with Adams. I don't think either no stack was played that well this year. Both have actually played pretty poorly. I think Tyson Alu Alu has been, been a bit worse than Montrevious Adams. Um, but Adams has not played well either in um, you're seeing a, a guy like Isaiah Lattimook at end. He's not playing well in the limited action he's got. Him. But just watch, you know, Linderbaum control this block here. And just to look at it from the aerial view right here in the middle, um, getting that push and the back follow, following behind. I understand double teams in those uh, messy situations. It's never going to look perfect and clean. Um, but you really felt like, and you can even see the body language here. I mean, just watch Larry Ogunjobi. I just noticed this actually. Watch him here getting beat up. It's another good run, shaking the head. I mean, that was Miles Jack earlier kind of had his hands in the air, like, what are we doing? Um, and Pittsburgh has big people in. They got three inside linebackers in the game. They only have one cornerback out there. I mean, they are trying to do everything they can with different personnel groupings, rotating people to uh, to try to, you know, stay fresh. But consistently, piles going forward. I mean, that is the theme of this game. 
Now I want to watch Isaiah Loudermilk and Miles Jack here. And again, two guys getting beat up. Loudermilk too high. Uh, poor leverage here. Miles Jack getting blown out. And it's another pile going forward. Another good game for Baltimore. You get the idea at this point. But I want to keep showing all the clips that I can find to really hammer home the issue. Um, Loudermilk, you know, is, is not played all that well this year. It's supposed to be the run stuff. We had a decent rookie season. Hasn't played a lot this year. Kind of regressed. And you see Jack. I know Ricard's coming in late. A, Ricard has no one to even block. I mean, that's the numbers they're gaining here. There's no one even, there's no hat for Ricard to even account for here. Um, with Pittsburgh not winning at the point here, not getting off of blocks, and Dobbins is just falling behind until somebody in the secondary finally takes him down. Very reminiscent of last year, um, the entire basically 2021 season. Minka made 11 tackles in this game. That's what he did consistently last year, talking Vikings game, talking Lions game. Um, it's a repeat performance of that. Finally, the last one we'll look at is the final offensive play from scrimmage, essentially run before the kneel downs, third and three. Pittsburgh has to get a stop here if they want to have a chance to win this game, and of course, they do not. And again, just the overall feel of not winning at the point of attack. You know, Devin Bush locked up by Ricard in the right gap. That's not an issue to me, but he's just not able to uh, take on the block, get off the block. Larry Joby getting manhandled ends up in the same gap as Montrevious Adams, who ends up on the ground. I mean, it's a mess all around. So I'm not trying to blame one person for this whole game or even this, on this one particular play. You're just seeing nobody basically winning. I think Okunjobi's a bit late out of a stance here. And again, DB's forced to to clean this one up. Now, should these guys have been playing in the box more, at least Minka, you know, maybe some of the stuff with the safeties, maybe a little bit weird trying to protect against a boot. I, I, don't, I don't really quite know. Um, but again, up front, Okunjobi, Adams, Bush, et cetera, um, those guys just never able to, to make a play in this one. And so what you get here is a very frustrated Cam Hayward on one of the final kneel downs, and that's about as much intensity as Pittsburgh's defense showed the entire game. And so I don't want to belabor it too much. I think I've talked enough in this video, um, but it, it, it was a multitude of issues. You allow 215. It's never one thing. It's never one person. So matter problems, missed assignment problems. But I think the number one thing you would put it to is just Pittsburgh losing the point of attack, not being strong enough, not being physical enough. And there's a, a lot of soul searching and a lot of hunting for talent probably in the offseason to be done. So that is my recap on on all the many issues that occurred. And Pittsburgh will have a, a, a pretty big task, believe it or not, against Carolina this weekend, who rushed for over 200 yards in their win over Seattle on Sunday. And so they don't they aren't known as the, the power running team that Baltimore is, but they got, they're having uh, success, obviously, to run for, for two bills. And so... We'll uh, see if Pittsburgh can adjust. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Appreciate you guys watching. If you guys could like this video and subscribe to the channel, I'd appreciate that. And we'll talk to you soon.